Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parlor, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Hi. Sarah, I am expecting to see some pages by the end of the week. You hear me? Uh, yeah, I know, I know. I am just working here. Are you fake typing? <laughs> no. Shall we discuss your deadline? No, anything but that. God, I wish I could return that stupid advance. Not stupid, it's amazing. Especially considering the fact that nobody reads anymore! What about right now? What if we just lived right now? Who is this guy? I don't know, looks like Austin Powers. Look for the chimney sweep, come on. Excuse me, weren't you at the Wanky Gallery in Fremont? I truly think you have me mistaken for somebody else. Who the hell are you? Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 320. Releasing February 5 on demand and digital is the right one. A romantic comedy that stars Cleopatra Coleman as Sarah, a struggling novelist who finds a muse in Godfrey, played by Nick Thune, a man of many disguises hiding a tragic past. Filled with charming performances and an engaging story, The Right One also marks the directorial debut of Ken Mock, who made a name for himself in the unscripted reality TV realm with shows like Making the Band and America's Next Top Model. And joining me today on the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is the director of The Right One, Ken Mock. Ken, I thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Matthew. So it's really interesting just looking at your career up to this day and like I said in my intro, you made a name for yourself as a producer in reality TV. Also, some feature films as well. You have Invincible and Joy to your name. And Joy, I'm such a big fan of that movie. Um, but with The Right One, this is your first time really getting behind the lens in a director's chair. And you wrote the script as well. Um, the inspiration to do that, um, why, where did that come about? And how long did it really take for you to kind of get your feet, the feet under you uh, in regards to carving out this new realm for yourself as a director? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, You know, when I started out in my career decades ago, you know, I had started out wanting to write and direct feature films. Uh, But what had happened was once the reality genre started in the early 2000s, like at the beginning of the 2000s, I had a skill set that allowed me to be able to produce reality. I had started out actually my very first incarnation. I I started out in news as a news producer. Mm -hmm. So when you're news producing, you write, you produce, you direct, you edit, and you have to put it together very quickly because you have to get it on the air, you know, that night. So you you, you literally have to cut like a two minute package in three hours and and get get on like nightly news. So that was a skill set that was very uh, transferable to the reality genre. So suddenly I got kind of sidetracked into that world and, I found a lot of success with that and, you know, created a whole bunch of shows. Uh, and then what happened was after a number of years of doing that, and, you know, Top Model, that show has been on the air for like 16 years, you know, for 24 cycles. I, I got to a point where it was feeling kind of rote. Yeah. And, you know, I was kind of falling into complacency. And I realized, listen, I've got another 20, 30 years ahead of me in, in, in the business you know, what do you want to do to keep yourself creatively challenged? Mm. And during that time, I had started producing movies. And as you said, I produced Invincible and I produced Joy. And although I love those two films and I'm very proud of them, you know, what I realized as a producer is that as a producer, you're not in the creative control of a film. You are there to service the vision of the director. And I'm used to being in creative control of the shows that I do. So I really realized that if I really wanted to continue a career in film and really, you know, pursue film in order to really have creative control over my films, I would not only have to write the film, I would also have to direct it. Yes. So really what happened was in the last three or four years, I really focused all my attention on writing. And I I had been writing, you know, spec scripts for many years, but, you know, I, I kind of only got to like a B plus level at the, at the screenwriting stage. And I was like, I'm not going to go out with that kind of, you know, 
uh, script because there's a lot of B plus and B writers out there. Mm-hmm. I'm only really going to start going out there and try to pursue this once I can really get a breakthrough in my writing and kind of get to the A level where I can really, you know, stand apart from the other writing. And in the last two or three years, I was able to, I think, you know, get beyond that. I, I, I kind of broke through. And as a result of that, my writing got a lot of attention and I was able to parlay that into directing. And that's how this, this project ended up happening. Also, do, going the writer director route as well also means going down the independent film route. And with yourself, with you know Joy, Joy and Invincible, that had ma- major studio backing behind it. And I'm sure with your TV shows as well, there was also uh, you had that kind of you know network TV backing as well. Now you're going down the independent route. What was that like for you? Um, because you want to have that creative control, but it also kind of means starting all over again, doesn't it? Uh, you know, Matthew, it, it really did. I, it wasn't even starting at zero. It, it was, I started in a negative space because, you know, it's funny. I, I, I've i talked to other young people who are like 23 and 24 years old yeah. that want to, you know, become, you know, filmmakers or screenwriters. And I said, you guys are literally in a better position than me because you're young. With, this is a, you know, a business, you know, about youth. You have no baggage attached to you. Mm. So you're this fresh talent coming in that the that the the entertainment world embraces. But I, even though I had a great have had a great track record in the entertainment business, my expertise was at the unscripted world. And so people want to keep you in that box in this business, right? So if you're from the unscripted world, they don't really believe you can write, they don't believe you can direct, you know, the, the, they don't think your skills will transfer from one field to the next. So it really was an obstacle at the start of this process for me to even be taken seriously as a writer, let alone as a director. And so it really took a lot of persistent door knocking on my part to really kind of bang on that door to get people to read my screenplay without prejudice, first of all. Yep. And then on top of that, uh, allowing me to direct. But, you know, the great thing that I had behind me and that every filmmaker needs you know, when, especially when they're going the independent route, is I found two producers who really believed in me. Uh, there was a woman named Jennifer Sanderson who just loved the scripts uh, that I wrote and Geneva Wasserman. And both of them really took the, you know, the mantle and took the lead in getting this film made and raising the money for the feature. So, you know, I was very lucky to have, you know, two true believers to really get this project moving forward. Let's talk about the right one. And I want to start with the character of Godfrey that's played by Nick Thune in the movie. I, yeah. I heard that the character is influenced somewhat by Peter Sellers. Is this correct? That is absolutely correct. Um, you know, one of the sources of inspiration for this film was, you know, my fascination with, with Peter Sellers. You know, for a lot of people out there who don't know who he is, he, he was most well known for playing Inspector Clouseau in the Pink Panther series. Yeah. But brilliant, you know, he was a brilliant actor, uh, a brilliant mimic. You know, he could do a Cockney accident, he could, accent, he could do any sort of accent. He could play a Southerner, he could play an Indian character, and he would seamlessly, like, inhabit that character. And, but what people really didn't know was that in real life, when Peter was not playing a role, he had no sense of himself. He had no identity. He didn't know who he was. He was like a cipher and everybody really talked about that and said that he really had mental difficulties as a result of that. He only came alive when he took on a role. And it really kind of led me to question what would cause a person to have such a lack of identity. And then I thought it probably had to be some sort of emotional trauma that happened to him. So when I started asking these questions, it kind of led me down this path towards the screenplay. And then what really put it over the top was a few years ago, I had, I had read this article in the New York times about this, this young woman who was a very big social influencer. She had a huge following, but then all of a sudden one day she quit. And the reason why she quit, she said was because everything she was posting online was fake. Yeah. And she couldn't deal with the pressure of that anymore. And it really started making me think about identity in our culture now and how in a lot of ways, social media is kind of corrupting identity because all of us are now presenting kind of inauthentic, curated versions of ourselves online. And, you know, when I talk to my daughter, who's 19 years old, she's like, oh, dad, I have an Instagram account 
And then I have a Finsta account. I'm like, what's a Finsta account? She goes, well, the Finsta account is the real Instagram account Mm -hmm. where you really put your real self on there and you share that with your friends. But the Instagram account is the one for public consumption. Right. And it really got me thinking about identity. So when I took that idea of identity and I took the idea of Peter and I put them together, I ended up with the screenplay. The other person in the film is, of course, Cleopatra Coleman, uh, fellow Australian, actually, from here, from New South Wales. Absolutely. And um, and what's interesting about her is that, you know, you have a movie that has comedians in it, stand-up comedians, Nick Dune, the stand-up comedian, um, uh, Eliza Schlesinger is also in the film, it's terrific as well. But yeah. I, I read that, it's really interesting about Cleopatra, is that she brought some, brought some unexpected comedic chops to the role, which kind of changed the tone of the film. Is this correct? That, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I had been a fan of Cleopatra's. And, you know, w- what happened on this film was I had actually written the role of, of Godfrey for a specific actor. Mm. And I showed the script to that actor and he flipped out over it. And he's like, let's do the film. As a result, I got a leading lady because that actor had a relationship with that leading lady. But what happened when, when, I, when I was prepping the film Six weeks before we were start shooting, he dropped out. And as a result, she dropped out. So I had no leads for my movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, and luckily, I was huge fans of Nick and Cleo's who were on my list for, for this film. So we quickly scrambled to get them, but I had never worked with Cleo. So by the time we were able to get their deals done, we were two weeks away from shooting. So I had never met Cleo, even though I knew she was a really good actress. So what happened was when she got on the set, she totally surprised me with her comedic chops. I didn't know she was as gifted comedically. There's a scene in the movie where she sees her ex in this park with his wife. Mm. And and that was the third day of shooting. And that scene came out incredibly funny for me because I had let the actors in that scene improv a little bit. And what Cleo brought to the table in that scene just kind of blew me away. And after that scene was shot, I I literally talked to Cleo and I said, you have changed the tone of this film because I wasn't expecting the comedy I was getting from you that I got today. And what happened then was I started rewriting her scenes to kind of push more comedy for her. And it changed the tone of the film because before the film was really more of a, a, a drama film with some comedic elements, but with Cleo coming in so strongly as a comedian, you had Nick delivering comedy, you had Cleo delivering comedy, and now you have Eliza delivering comedy and David Koechner. Yes. So the tone of the film changed in a very positive way and in a way that really pleased me. So, you know, I was, like I said, I was really impressed with, with Cleo in this film. It's interesting. You've been around in the industry for such a long time. You've worked in such big projects. But when you work on something like this, you can essentially say, you know, is your baby. You had a creative drive behind it. You dare throughout it. You got, you faced the challenges and now you have a just finished product on the screen. And not only that, it's almost like a career change because you're going into the directorial realm as well. What's the level of satisfaction like knowing that you did it, you did the hard yards, you put it out there and now people are going to watch it come February 5th. Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. Um, Matthew, I, I, I got such satisfaction out of this film because I was able to control the film from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, and it's, it, it, I will tell you, you know, and I'm sure you've talked to many other independent filmmakers. It's an arduous process. Yes. It really is. It's, it's one of the most difficult things you can do and the pressure never relents. I mean, I still feel the pressure right now because the film has not been released yet. And I don't know how it's going to be received. Although the early indicators are, it's being received really well. People are really responding to the film. So I'm so happy about that. But, you know, you know, I had to use every single skill I had on this film, not only from writing it, but not only directing, but producing it and doing the post and, and handling every single aspect of this film. But I got tremendous satisfaction out of it because I didn't have to work with a studio on this. Mm. Um, it was just my financiers. And so I didn't have to deal with notes coming from other executives and other people and other perspectives. It was my baby. And the film came out, the, the, the end result of this film is purely from, from me. There's no other influences in it. And so, you know, I, I, I'll live it or die by this film. 
Uh, but you know, I'll bear the full responsibility of it, but I'm, I'm very happy to, to be able to do that and, and to say, you know, this is an expression, a, a complete hundred percent expression of me. So for everyone out there listening, February 5, On Demand in Digital, The Right One, starring Cleopatra Coleman and Nick Dune. Perfect uh, timing for Valentine's Day. I uh, want to watch a romantic comedy. Uh, I've, I saw a tweet that you put out there, Ken, where you said it's your fresh take on it, and it definitely feels like a fresh take on a genre that can be stale at times. So congratulations to you in regards to your debut film, and hopefully we'll see much more of you behind the lens as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. I really appreciate it.